I believe it was in the late 70s, used to be a rock and roll song about pack my piano last, man. The roadies want to hear me play. I want to play, you know, put up the drums, put up the guitars. Was it Jackson Brown or uh, Billy Joel? I don't remember. Y'all write me and tell me. But remember that old song? You know, the fans are gone. I still want to play. Well, I like shoot my prime all the time. We're getting ready to head to Oklahoma. So I'm going to get a few shots in. We're going to go see a cool landowner down there. Look at that property. And I wanted to share with you all a little bit about what we do. So we've studied ahead of time, looked at various and sundry satellite images. It's changed all the emails and conversations. But nothing beats setting down. So we'll get to his office, whip out a map, talk about, you know, his past experiences. Maybe deer he's harvested, something like that. And his goals and objectives, because it's not just a plan. It should be a plan tailored to the landowner's goals and objectives. Get a few more shots in, we're gonna hit the road. So mounts are never accurate, right? I mean, you hope they are, but they get forms and whatnot. But basal circumference, I mean, this deer is great on basal circumference, got a little non-typical stuff here. Um, basal circumference is not a perfect indicator of age, but it's pretty good. Pedicles continue growing through life, mm -hmm. even though as they get senile, the rest of it may get smaller, that pedestal doesn't get smaller. Mm -hmm. If you get a really old buck, a lot of times they have a really small, a big base, and then it gets real small right after that. Right. But it's really old. Um, so that, I would have no doubt believing that's a mature deer, and he carries his mass out well. That's another sign mm -hmm. of maturity to carry mass out well. So his teeth aging came back at five and a half. Yeah. On him. I, I have no problem believing that. On his I mean, I'm not, you know, five, six, seven, I don't know, but right. yeah, cement and manuli. Are you talking, looking at the wear and tear or cement and manuli? No, cement and manuli. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's only one lab you should use. Which? And that's a lab in Montana called Matson's Lab. Gary Matson, Gary Matson, who's retired now, uh, he created that technique. Okay. And every state agency, Canadian agency, African agency that's serious about wildlife management uses that lab. Okay. They have more samples than anyone on the planet. They're the best. They've refined their technique better than anyone else. Okay. Matt's, Gary Matson, Matson's lab. They're an awesome lab. Yep. Okay. Um, they're, they may be a dollar or two more sample. It's irrelevant for yep. what we do. Um, uh, these are two sheds off of a deer from this year, actually, a matching set. Uh -huh. That we thought was maybe three and a half or four and a half. Four and a half is kind of what we've been calling him. I know you can't see the photos, but yeah. But I, yeah. I mean, it's a real healthy shed. Um, the way it come off the deer is very healthy. It's got the right shape, and that's a real good sign. Yeah. I don't see any sign of brain abscess or anything like that. Um, all the non-typical points, is that typical for your herd? You typically see some kickers and stuff on your deer? I would say so. We either get that or just like the smaller, like a clean eight, you know, and then we start seeing deer like, you know, the this is more common of a deer for us. It's not a big frame. It's more of a heavy, not just not yeah. a common deer. This is a big deer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's I mean, great deer. the antler characteristics are yeah. typically more mass than it is a big frame, long points. So these young boys have really clean skin, and you're kind of medium, and I've got all these skin tags and everything on me. And deer like humans, as we get older, we throw more skin tags and stuff, and deer will throw more non-typical points as they get older. You may remember, well, I'm noticing one here, but uh, typicals were real common. And if you killed a non-typical when I was a kid, you were, you know, you were talking at a barber shop. That's because almost no deer lived to be owed. Right. They, were no, they weren't getting old enough to be non-typicals. And now the big trophy is a clean five-year-old typical because very few five-year-olds don't have some non-typical points. Right. We got some warts and skin tags by the time we get that old. Um, so everything you tell me so far is stacking up, you know, kind of normal deer biology. 99% uh, of the people we work with do not harvest enough does, and we know yeah. that walking on your land pretty quick. We'll see what native browse is out there. Okay. Uh, planted browse could be a drought, could taste a little bit better than native browse, or really hitting your food plots. Native browse doesn't lie. Okay. And it's gonna show years of browse pressure, right? We're gonna know, you know, what's been going on. Okay. Um, so that all looks good. The the secondary kind of result is obviously how do we go from two or three five and a half year olds to ten if that's a realistic goal. I don't know if it is or isn't. I don't know if you want to get to ten because most deer start declining in health by ten. Okay. Uh, and there no, I, I don't mean ten years old. I mean. Oh, I said ten. How, you how, want yeah, 10. How, do I, how do I get from I only having one or two? I think ten's probably a little deer. bit aggressive. Okay. Uh, I consider it a real success 
if people can harvest, not just grow, but harvest a, a you know, a four or five, a solid mature buck, mm -hmm. call it five on your place, uh, every 250 acres or so. Okay. That's, that's, there's, there are places that exceed that, but there's always a, a refuge right next door. Or, you know, there's something that's building up that aid structure okay. a little bit. Well, that's six or seven then, so it's. Yeah, I would say, because y'all are probably gonna manage a little bit better, just, you know, the data you sent me is more than what most people do, stuff like that. So seven, eight, try to top in somewhere in there. And okay. it's gonna change some years because maybe y'all were busy elk hunting or something, you didn't harvest a couple of years before, so you carried a few over. Right. And then you're gonna have an EHD outbreak and it drops down to be an age class, some fawns that got knocked down somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. So one thing to consider, um, this is unpopular, but you're you're knocking on the door of being in CWD world, pretty good. Probably here now. Oklahoma doesn't test very well. Um, don't know, but it's certainly in the state, and it's certainly all around you. And so you know, and there's all the rumors and everything out there. There's all the rumors. Wyoming has deer herds where these guys will never hunt because of CWD. This is I'm just talking fact now, not internet rumors. I have personally been uh, many years ago to the state vet pen, the state research facility in Wyoming, and when CWD, the first CWD meeting I went to was almost 40 years ago now. I mean, I've been in this a long time. This is not just when it got popular recently. Um, and in that pen, they didn't know, oh, one cow out died, didn't really know what's going on anyway, did, you know, state vet figured out CWD this years ago. I think they had 14 or 15 cow elk in this for some research, it's like 14 acre pen. And they all died CWD, they got them out of there, they waited five years, thinking, oh, it's good now, put more elk in there, and they all died, CWD. So CWD is the most serious thing facing your deer herd by far. And Oklahoma's plan to release genetically restrained deer is only gonna make it worse. There's no chance it can make it better. I don't know how that got passed, but it was a horrible thing. Um, so there is no genetically proof CWD deer just so you don't get caught up in this nonsense. There is a strain of deer that will survive about two years longer. And all that's doing is urinating, defecating, salivating more prions on the landscape, so it makes it worse, not better. There are no deer known to man that are CWD proof, period. So that was a really bad play for Oklahoma, and it will impact your hunting uh, in a negative way. Yeah, I'm uh, not even aware of it, so. Yeah, not either. Uh, you had one commissioner get it passed through your, your state legislation to release pin raised deer so someone can make a bunch of money. You know, you're not going to throw out 100 or 1,000 deer in the state of Oklahoma and change the genetics. And even if you do that, there's no genetically proof deer known to mankind right now. Just some that do live a little longer. Like, if I had a strain of flu that lasted two more, well, I'm healthy and I carried it two more weeks, I would just infect more people over those two weeks. Well, that's what that's doing in simple terms. So anyway, I don't think you're not seeing enough mature deer because of CWD, but that is a possibility. Mm -hmm. I have a client in the very, very northwestern corner of Kansas. I don't have them anymore. Uh, they have 30,000 almost contiguous acres, corn, soybean, alfalfa, and pasture ranch. It's ideal deer habitat. And they used to harvest a ton of 200 plus inch deer every year. I mean, they sold them for high dollar hunts. I mean, their family wasn't that big a hunter, but they knew it was a big source of income for them. A uh, very big source of income. That doesn't happen at all anymore. No deer live that old. Wow. So, yeah, I mean, no deer live that old. So, um, could be, I don't think it is. CWD doesn't, or Oklahoma doesn't do almost no testing, so we don't have that kind of data. I harvested a very mature buck at our place last year. First one I personally killed had CWD, and you watch the footage, and I've seen all the choke camera pictures of him, knew, it, knew that deer for a couple years, and that meat was in my freezer, and, and the results come back positive, had CWD. You're not gonna see it, know about it, anything like that. You have your big pond we saw stocked, is that a fishing? Lance and I just come on down the property a little bit and Lance was just explaining, boy this Cloverfield a couple weeks ago was looking good, he's going to share a picture with us. And then today, I'm going to say, what do you think, Lance, 50% of it's brown? Yeah. Something like that? At least. Yeah. yeah. Versus, I don't know if you can see that in your camera, but that's what it was yeah. about four weeks ago. 
So there was uh, some really high temperatures a couple of days ago, or a week ago, something like that. Yep, over 100, 100 for about eight days in a row. Eight days of 100 degree. And clover, man, it's clover's probably the most widely thought of deer food plot plant. I mean, clover just kind of, food plot clover, it's almost like you're saying the same thing, right? Right. But clover works great in Michigan or north, northern New York where days rarely get real warm. They get 68 inches of rain a year. This part of Oklahoma, Missouri, where I am, well, we have a drought every summer, it seems like. Is it early, mid, or late, or all summer? We don't know, but we have right. a dry period. Uh, and clover will do this. It'll just let you down. Right now, does are making milk for those fawns. Antlers are growing, and, you know, we're, we're not looking yeah. too hot right here. So clover, I like, in this part of the world, in a lot of the deer range, I like really strong annual clovers. Mm -hmm. You plant them in the fall, man, they start doing a little stuff fall and spring. They're just super strong, really nutritious. About the time you plant your summer food plots, they're done. Yep. Instead of playing for a high quality perennial clover, I think annual clovers, for those of us in these latitudes in these areas, probably a little bit better tool. Okay. Roughly 20 stems have been bitten off right. in a fast count. You don't have a lot of leaves trying to feed that. Right. So if you don't have photosynthesis, you can't get a very big root system. So not the plant's fault at all, just right. more mouths than food right now. And you're and you're taking some uh, does off here, but you kind of I think indicated this when we first met. Maybe not enough, or right. you're not telling a difference. You harvest a bunch one year, and next year you got just meat deer. You haven't hit that top threshold yet. So again, here we are in mid July. We got August, September, uh, first part of October before we get a lot of growth out of our fall crop here, just mm -hmm. based on when you're probably gonna plant. And this is going to get really skinny between now and then. Right. The amount of food out here. So just got to change our system a little bit. Fine to come back. You have, uh, you know, again, we're going that big tree back there, folks. That's a pecan tree and way around. This is a big field. How many do you know roughly? Uh, I mean, it's about four and a half, may, maybe close to five, I think. Yeah. And, you know, five acre field and beans aren't cutting it under the current rotation. And so a couple things we can do, we can get our fall rotation better. We need, probably need to plant more beans per acre. Uh, one bag would be 140,000 seeds per acre. Mm -hmm. Not all of them ever make a bean, obviously. A lot of food plots, I like to plant 200, 220,000 seeds per acre. Okay. Because you just got more stems for deer to bite on when they're young. Gives some of them more of a chance to get big and make pods and do stuff. Okay. So just there's an upper limit to that. I wouldn't probably plant any more than 220,000 seeds per acre. But 200, 220,000 seeds per acre from what I'm seeing right now would be a good number to shoot for. What should you do in those smaller plots where the clover's failing? Some uh, of them we just let the wheat grow up and head out and just said we're not going to plant spring. Because the, the beans, they just eat them all. Yeah, I don't think we want to put beans on small plots at all. Yeah. I think we do want to plant something, though, because it's just becoming a weed patch now. Right. And not providing much nutrition except some wheat seeds and then that's a flat you know they get to the right stage you eat them and they're gone deer turkey right eat them and gone so anyway i think we can do a little bit better on that but we're talking you know again four or five acres whatever you got here and just drove around a big old section of native prairie that could have a lot of food in it but it's got a lot of cerecia and stuff in there now mm -hmm. so we can gain a bunch of tons of high quality food by getting the invasive exotics out and putting the fire in there and getting the natural browse coming up. Okay. And we've seen some of those species here. We know that seed bank's here. We have to encourage it and take competition away. Okay. I see this sometimes, but I mean, I've walked by, I don't know, a dozen or so mare's tail that the top's been bit out of. And like in Iowa, where there's not much native browse or something, you see more mare's tail bit on. If you're in an area like mine where I got pretty good native browse, you rarely see, you will see it, but very rarely see mare's tail with the top bit out of mm -hmm. it. But, you know, here's one. I, bet I, I, I haven't walked over here yet, folks. This is not pre-planned, but, you know, we're going to walk around and see some more mare's tail. Right and right here is a bunch right here. Yep. that the top's been bit out of. And that's not that common. That's a sign of not enough groceries. Again, if you're in Iowa, deer eat it because until there's crops coming up, there's not. it's not like they're going to 100 acres and 80 browse over there, right? Right. Uh, so 
they'll eat it there, but in your area, that should not be happening this much at this level. Okay. Off camera, Lance just mentioned they had really good success, youth hunting, whatever, taking does, helping out the management. And so, but we had some buck bucks killed, nice ground many, and it was about 10% of the total darvers, which I think is the perfect number, because if you're, you know, you're getting 30%, you got some people that are a little trigger happy, they're not even looking. There's all oh, there's an antler steer I'm shooting, right? And that's not gonna work out good. And if you're at three or four percent, unless you got all expert hunters out there, you're probably being too conservative and you won't get your doe harvest. Or you got guys that are really buck that it makes use. Well, I couldn't tell if it's a bud buck or not, but I could sure tell that three year old buck walked out and he was really supposed to be five year old. So the worst buck you can lose on your property is the one one year below your harvest. You guys are trying to grow five year old deer. You don't want to lose a four-year-old because you've really got five years of vest. You know, button buck, year and a half, two and a half, three and a half, four and a half. You got five hunting seasons invested in getting that deer to four. Right. And so I put money in a CD, and if you take it out early, you get penalized. You take it out one day early, you get penalized. Well, you take that four-year-old buck if your goal is five. This is up to the landowner, folks. I get a lot of hate mail. I, 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 wherever you hunt, that may not be the goal. I think the good goal should be, I want to obey the landowner. I want to get invited back. I want to do what the landowner's objectives are. So, you know, if the landowner says, if we want to shoot five-year-old older bucks and you can't tell the difference, put your binoculars out, put your gun down, because you shouldn't be shooting. And if your goal is, hey, we got to kill 80 does, and then, boys, I need you shooting does. And what I oft, I've done, physically done, and often recommend, if you're in a situation where you may have more mouths than food, I tell my guests, you have to harvest X number, usually it's five for me, five does before you get a buck tag. And if you only kill three does this year, you can carry those three over to next year if you get invited back, but you still gotta get to a total of five. And that does a couple of things. Helps you get your doe harvest. Uh, you're not gonna let all your guests shoot bucks willy nilly because they may not be able to identify the right age class, but those that can. Sure. And B, uh, by the time they kill five does, they've probably seen some of your better two and three year old bucks. And they bring you a picture on their cell phone and you say, oh, you know, that's a good deer, but it's not quite what we're looking for. Versus the first night out here, and that really nice 138 inch three road steps out and you say, man, that's a great deer, but that's not the deer we want to harvest. So it slows them down and lets them see some bucks on a well-managed property before they get to pulling the trigger. Because it's tough to take the old boy from you know, heaven forbid, South Florida or somewhere, and I do a lot of work in South Florida, and bring him to the Midwest, well, yeah, that three-year-old deer looks like a whopper, right? He's, he's getting ready to call Boone and Crockett because he just killed the world record. And, you know, so, and I've been that way with elk and other critters, so just slow down a little bit, and getting a doe harvest under your belt gives you some time in the blind or stand to see some bucks and realize that's the standard for this property. Had a great tour with Lance and Lance. What's some of the takeaways you, you you know you got from our visit today? Yeah, I think some of the things that uh, we're left to work with is you know improving the quality of our food and learn a little uh, quite a bit about our soil and some of the absences that we have in that and being able to get more diversity in the plant species that are there to try to get better soil structure to try to deliver some of those nutrients from the soil back to the deer or mm -hmm. whatever's consuming it. So. Yeah. But it looks like we're light on food, uh, generally speaking, I think is probably the main takeaway. And we can either reduce the mouse or increase the food or maybe a little bit of both. Yeah, look forward to following up with Lance. They're, they've got a great property. And this one is probably just the way it's conditions in right now, a little easier to improve than a lot of properties. So I'm feeling like we're going to be looking good here in a couple of years. And hopefully we'll give you an update. Really appreciate you watching Growing Deer today. And Lance, thanks for letting us come out. Absolutely. Thanks for yeah. coming. And I hope all of y'all take time to enjoy creation, but more importantly, seek that creator's will for your life and apply it daily. Thanks for watching. Growing Deer.